The power of large language models is expanding rapidly, but I think a lot of the time we get caught up just talking about the models themselves, and not necessarily the tooling around models that dictates how we can interact with them. For most people, they like to have an interface, and it's why ChatGPT and Cloud offer the two best options in my opinion. Sure, there's Perplexity, which is a really interesting hybrid of those, and I really don't think most people are using LLMs in the terminal, aside for benchmarks and some very niche tools like Ader, which developers use. And there's a reason why tools like Cursor have taken off so rapidly, and the same reason would kind of explain why so many companies have tried to rip off Cursor with open source forks, some even managed to raise money doing this. So what I want to talk about today is a really interesting tool I found on Twitter. Basically, it claims that it provides a lot of the same features as Cloud Sonnet 3.5 and its incredible Artifacts UI which visually sort of represents what it's doing and gives you much more rich information as to what the LLM is throwing back at you and how you might want to redirect the LLM to do what you want. This tool is called Fragments by E2B and I think it's pretty cool. And it also works on open source models basically for free. This tool is entirely free. You can hook up your closed sourced AI API keys and it also works locally with Llama 3 using Olama with a number of actually open source models from Mistral as well that you can use right away for free. So welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. This tool is really interesting, and I was surprised that I had never heard of this. In retrospects, I had friends at Perplexity that had mentioned that they actually use this in certain parts of their tooling. But we'll get into what E2B actually does outside of just building tools like this in just a bit. So what this tool is, is basically a way that you can interact with a list of nearly 20 different LLMs, each with their own templates and their own advantages or disadvantages, and have a very similar interface to what you get with Cloud Sonnet 3.5 artifacts. And I'd go as far to say as just calling this an open source version of Cloud Sonnet 3.5 artifacts. But one that you can use with almost every single relevant large language model that's in existence today. And roughly, I would call this kind of a single AI template to build full stack AI apps with just prompts, which to be frank is kind of what this tool is meant to do. So why is building this kind of a thing so hard? So what makes tools like Cursor really powerful is it sort of dictates a pattern of interaction with large language models. And this is before we get into anything agentic. So for instance, Cursor solved the issue of having to constantly be clicking back and forth between either a terminal or an instance of an LLM and pasting back and forth into an editor. Because obviously the flow there is you're using a code editor and you want to be closer to the editor, but understand how you're stepping through problems and more importantly, understand what context you're providing a model with consecutive prompts. So basically if you change one file and it's wrong, how do you tell the model that you want to focus on just that file to correct whatever mistake it might have made, but also still say that you want it to work in the context of maybe five other files that might represent you know, a Python or a JavaScript project. Cursor makes this much easier. And the reason artifacts from cloud is so interesting is it kind of generalized this flow. So if you were doing things with code, it could run the code and show you what it actually does. If you wanted to have it write something or you wanted to have it format something in Markdown, it could just show you what it would look like in Markdown and then you could directly interact with it. It also gives you kind of a versioning pattern, whereas you can reference a specific version for things you like or don't like and then create a consecutive version that might be closer to what you actually want. And this is one of the core patterns in Cursor, and it's also a big reason why, just in terms of how humans interact with computers and interact with websites, that this works so well with uh, Cloud's artifacts. And I'm curious if there are any features in Artifacts or with the ChatGPT UI that you think are missing or that would make the product much better. And also, you know, if this maybe carries over to things that Olama or LM Sys don't have. But let me know in the comments below. So this tool is pretty interesting, but let's get into a little bit of what E2B is. This is going to get a little technical, but basically what E2B builds is they build an SDK that is effectively a sandbox you can run AI-generated code in. Because obviously, if you're running any kind of code in a sandbox on servers that other people write that you're not checking, there is a chance that it might be doing bad things. So their core product as a tech company is an area where you can generate code and then actually execute it in a sandbox and not worry about it doing really nasty things to your infrastructure or to your servers. So for instance, you really need this if you want to have kind of an artifacts-esque flow because a big part of understanding if it works or not is actually running the code. And this is actually something that's already been used by Perplexity for some time and a number of other companies that either use generative AI as part of their uh, dev flow or as a core attribute of their product. So for instance, Perplexity. And they show kind of a basic demo here saying, yeah, you can run stuff in here and you don't have to really worry about it doing nasty things. And one of the biggest ways to showcase that is giving everyone the ability to do that publicly 
on your servers um, without even logging in. And what's also really cool about this company is they fully embrace open source. Sometimes when I make videos, you guys are like, like oh, well, they're a closed source company. They're, they're not really doing a lot with open source. And I think they're still, and I still think they're important players in the evolution of AI generally that do happen to be closed source. So I, so I do cover those sometimes. But what's cool about E2B is they're incredibly open about their products. For instance, they have a public change log, which is effectively just pulling from their GitHub, but they say what changes they're making week to week, which is pretty cool and also a lot of work. They have excessive documentation um, for both their SDK and some of their pricing and how to track usage. And they give a ton of information on their blog with how they're updating E2B, how they're working with other players in uh, sort of the development of large language models and the direction of certain products they have. But now let's jump into their tool and see if we can build a basic app. So what's interesting is their interface is very simple. You can prompt, obviously, you can attach files, there is a submit button, and then most importantly, there are some personas you can select from. So these personas are important because they dictate what kind of an application you want to make. And I do want to make it clear that the idea of this demo is to make an app. It's not really to just do anything with um, these artifacts. It's aimed at code. So you can do Python data analyst, Next.js, Vue.js, Streamlit developer, and Gradio developer. We're going to leave it on auto for now because I think that'll showcase just how good this is. And I've selected Mr. Large, but there are a number of models you can use. So for instance, you can use a number of the OpenAI models. You can use Cloud 3.5 Sonnet from Anthropic, a few different models from Google, the Mistral models, and then a number of different models that are all basically different derivations of Llama 3.1. And again, what's really cool is you can hook up Olama and actually use local compute to run this. And this is entirely open source. So if you want to try to run fragments locally entirely, um, their GitHub repo is open for this and I'll link it below. So let's say I want to make an app that will take a tweet and render an image of the preview. So I've basically requested for an app that will accept the tweet link and ret return a high resolution image of the tweet that I can use in blogs. And I've said I want a front end and an API that I can call pro programmatically. So let's see what we get here. So right off the bat, this is pretty quick. So it's decided to use Next.js, which I think is a good choice for this. And it says, I will create a Next.js application that includes a front end interface for users to input a tweet link and an API endpoint to fetch and return high resolution images of the tweet. The front end will use Tailwind, so another good option. Pretty common. Uh, the API will use the Twitter API to fetch the tweet data and a library like um, HTML to Canvas to generate an image. So that's pretty smart. The only thing here is that the Twitter API, I don't think actually exists anymore, but we'll have to see. So it gave us a segment here and let's see what it shows us. So this is the code it gave me. And this is pretty impressive, especially since it's just within a few specific files. So granted, this is all using APIs, but it's pretty cool that it was able to put this all together. And the preview is pretty impressive. So it gave me the ability to enter this uh, URL to generate an image. And I was pretty impressed. Obviously, I need an actual Twitter API key to make this work. And it, it's pretty clear this is meant to be a product demo because there's this deploy button up in the corner here. But uh, this is pretty impressive. You do still need API keys for most of these models but the flow here is almost identical. This is a really clever and easy way to add the ability to just execute code um, and not worry about it kind of doing weird things to a number of models that don't like natively support that. And there are obviously a number of local tools like LMSYS or Olama that don't necessarily support this yet. And there are good reasons to not necessarily always run this code on your local machine because wild things kind of might happen if you're not kind of keeping an eye on things. So it gave us workable code, the formatting is nearly perfect, and what I really like is its architectural choices are also quite good. Obviously, it's probably going to default to Next.js a lot of the time because that's where a lot of the most modern tooling is, and most people aren't really building web apps or quote-unquote like full-stack apps just in Python these days, but HTMX is getting there, so we'll see. Let me know if you guys are curious. I mean, are there models that you wish had local code execution to actually show you if what they're doing is working or not? And also to give them more context so that, you know, models that maybe would benefit from having this sort of feedback loop of executing code and double checking it works, could make them better. Do you wish that there were other models supported by this? Um, do you think we should have a unified template that makes building interfaces like this much easier for everyone? Maybe adding on to this open source project in the future. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, I'm curious as always. And as usual, I hope you learned something in this video. And if you like our content, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you in the next one.